same friend. Shall we bow our heads just for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this and other privilege that we have to assemble ourselves together. This great mammoth tabernacle here where our beloved brother had dedicated to you long years ago. Since then has been a shining light to the world, led the nation to prayer early in the morning through their broadcast. We thank thee for everything that the Cato Tabernacle stands for, and that is Jesus Christ. And we are grateful for the privilege of being assembled here tonight for this great convention that's going on. We pray, Father, that this will be a, a memorial to all the world of the unbelievers that Jesus Christ still lives and reigns. Grant that his presence will be so with us tonight and so predominant that it will drive out every scratch of doubt. And the Holy Spirit may have the right of way and speaker and hear. For we ask that in the name of thy beloved child, the Lord Jesus, amen. May the God of heaven bless you all richly tonight as we minister in his name. And it was last night I was just a little late with you, but I always Satan working on both ends of the line, you know, and so does God. But I had to drive fast to get here last evening, and I never thought about you sitting there fanning, and, and, and I myself, I, I was hot too up here. But we are trying to, by the grace of God, to escape a hotter place. And, and then, so we won't even have this kind of a fan down there. So we're thankful that we're not going that way. And we're trying to take everyone we can with us the other way. We say that by grace, with fear and trembling in our heart, working out our own salvation. May the Lord bless you. How many in here knows F.F. F. Bosworth? Let's see your hand. Just got a long-distance call from him a few moments ago. They think he's dying. And he's nearly 100 years old. Preached right off this pulpit here. Had great campaigns here years ago from the Cato Tabernacle. I've been closely associated with him for the past 8 or 10 years. He's been overseas with me. But nearing way up near 100 years old. And he's just been too feeble to get around lately. And Mrs. Bosworth called me said that he was very sick. I give her the assurance that we, the people here at the tabernacle tonight, would join in prayer for Brother Bosworth. And now, shall we do that as we bow our heads? Our Heavenly Father, as I've looked upon that age, patriarch of the gospel, seen him stand gallantly in the pulpit without a fear, proclaiming the great message of the Lord Jesus, knowing that age and old as he is tonight, and laying there in Miami in a very serious condition, knowing that I'm standing tonight in his tracks here where he stood at the same pulpit many years ago, preaching the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. And seemingly, as far as we know, that he's near his end of the journey. And we pray, Father, if that be so, that you'll receive his soul in peace. But if it be possible, we ask that if you have a little work yet for him to do here on earth, that you'll spare him out of this siege. That's our prayers as we go thousand strong to you tonight. There's no doubt around the clock. If they only knew this, they're praying for him. Deliver him, we pray, God. And we ask that you'll comfort his wife and his children as they're waiting answer from heaven. We're so glad to know that his sins are under the blood. As a gallant soldier with many shining stars under, not only there but here on earth as the ministers going out preaching the gospel as he set forth. And we pray for Brother Bosworth sincerely with all of our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless his gallant soul. Now, Brother Bosworth has stood with me in many great battles. A few years ago, we come from Africa. And yet a man near 80, 
you're still good at the battlefront. I believe, I don't say this through prejudice, not because he's sick, but I've said it on tapes and around the world, that I believe Brother Bosworth knows more of the Bible on divine healing than any man I ever met in my life. That's right. And not only that, but he lives everything he teaches. You know, it's better to live me a sermon than preach me one. <laughs> I think that's lots better. We all feel that way about it. Live me a sermon. We are written epistles, read of all man. Now, I had just a few things here I wanted to say just before we start to speak. Now, tomorrow night, I'm speaking tonight again on divine healing, and tomorrow night may change the program just a little bit. Still praying for the sick. But... Sometimes it's question in the meeting, what makes me weak? I want to answer that question right quick, that I can. There's no way of answering it. Sometimes they don't let me stay but just a few moments. Here sets the boys in the pit here. Brother Woods is somewhere which will be standing at the end of the line. My son, they watch me. It's an anointing. It's in another world. To you scientific searchers, it's another dimension. You're going back down the stream of time through a man or woman's life. It's foreknowledge of God that tells them what was and what will be. No, nothing can heal. There's, healing has already purchased the Calvary. No other healing can come but there. It's already done. It's your individual faith in the Lord Jesus. Therefore, I might say this. Did you notice in St. John 5, as I asked you to read last night, all the virtue of the angel went off the water. The first one was healed. Daniel, the prophet, saw one vision. He said he was troubled at his head for many days. A woman touched the garment of the Lord Jesus, and he said, I perceive that virtue has gone from me. Got weak. Weakness. Many people who are spiritual are prophets, are considered neurotic. How many knows that? Let's just take a few of the natural, where the natural man would understand it. Let's take, I think, America's greatest folk songwriter was Stephen Foster. He was a poet. And he wind his way into inspiration. And when he got up there, he'd write a song. Then when he'd come down, he would, he would get on a drum. He just didn't know what to do with himself. Finally, one time coming out of inspiration... He called a servant and took a razor and committed suicide. Stephen Foster. How many ever heard of this William Kuyper that wrote that famous song, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains? I stood by his grave not long ago in London, England. I was there to pray for King George. Bowed my head and cried. He was considered an erotic, crazy. When he wrote that song, There Is a Fountain Filled with Blood, many of you have heard the history of it. He got in a cab and tried to find the river to commit suicide. He dropped down out of inspiration. He didn't know where he was at. Look at Jonah, the prophet. God gave him a message, and he preached it with such force to a city larger than Indianapolis. And he went through the streets of proclaiming the message of God with such force that even the people put sackcloth on their animals. And when the inspiration left him, he sat under a little gourd tree and prayed for God to take his life. See? Coming out of inspiration. There was Dan, uh, Elijah, the prophet. God gave him inspiration. He called all the prophets of Balaam and proved that God was God. He brought fire out of heaven and rain the same day. And when the inspiration left him, he wandered in the wilderness for 40 days and nights, and God found him pulled up in a cave somewhere. Is that right? So don't wonder at that. It's God. There's no way to explain it. It's just God. You go off into another world. And when you return back, if one vision would make Daniel feel trouble at his head for many days, what do you think? One vision after vision after vision. If one pulling of virtue from the woman that pulled the gift of God through his son, Christ Jesus, would make virtue go out of the Son of God and he'd get weak, what would it do to a sinner saved by grace, the same Spirit working? And sometimes 
people are thinking that it would be something that I could do for them. There's nothing I can do. If I could and wouldn't do it, I'd be a brute. The only thing I can do to you is point you to the Lamb of God that's done all for you. I'm not much of a preacher, but my gift is something else. All that works together with preaching has to be based on the Word, and all that works together to confirm the presence of the living God with us. And it's all together of God. And sometimes that way, when we give out prayer cards, that's to keep a line in order. The man that we just prayed for was the one who introduced it. Years ago, you old customers here at the Tabernacle, custom to coming, rather. You remember Mr. Bosworth had his prayer line here in the Cato Tabernacle maybe 20, 30 years ago or more? That's the way he prayed for them, by lining them up. Well, we used to send all each minister a hundred or two prayer cards. But it was cooperating in the meeting. That wouldn't work. The first time we got there, the first minister got his group in. That settled it. The rest of them didn't get in. It caused contention among the ministers. Then we went to taking someone with us and let them give out all the prayer cards the first day. All was there, first come, first serve. That cut the man that couldn't get there on the first day. There was no need to come, and he'd never get in the prayer line. Because if he come in the second day or the second hour, he didn't get a chance. So then we started to having someone to come along with us and give out prayer cards every day. And when we would do that, we would let some little child sit on the front seat and start counting. Wherever he stopped counting, there we'd start. Believe it or not, people put their little children up there and know just where mommy's prayer card was at. That wouldn't work. So we had many things. So each day we give out new prayer cards. The newcomers has a, a right or to get in to get a prayer card. But the prayer card doesn't mean nothing. And every night, we don't start from number one. We start from maybe 10, 20, 30, 50, 90, 100, or somewhere and come backwards, forwards, and mix them up in every way. So no one knows. No one. The man who are giving them out never knows. I don't even know myself. So I get here and wherever I feel led to start, that's where I start from. We don't get too many up here because the only thing it is to do is get the inspiration started. It's too bad we just only had five days in this big tabernacle. Just about time we get all the spooks away where you are not scared of me. Then it's time to go. Just watch how the meeting, how the, the, the power of the meeting grows each time. Watch how the Spirit reaches out when you begin to get that little thing of doubt away from your mind. Watch how He goes out there and catches it. There's more healed out in the audience there is on the platform. Many times more. The idea isn't to touch me, it's touch Him. Now, America, it's very hard to get it to them. They're used to people laying their hands on them. That's all right. That's the old Jewish custom. The Gentile custom is... I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will live. He knew the authority of the word because he said he was a man under authority. So now, that's why we give out prayer cards. Everyone can have one each night as the boys give them out. And now, the main thing is to sit with an open heart and say, Lord Jesus, I believe and I challenge your faith. You see what happens if you'll do that. From the depths of your soul, just take everything away from you. Say, Lord, I believe. Now, I have no way at all of knowing who's who and what he's going to say. But he does it himself. That's sovereignly. I can't make it work. That would be a telepathy. It isn't I make it work. It works me. I don't work it. <laughs> so just look, live, and believe. Now, I want to say this, that... Maybe medical doctors are sitting close. I want to say this to the medical doctors, as I have it down here, that we have nothing against the practice of medicine or surgery, hospitals, or whatever it is. Amen. We are very grateful for those things in these days. They shouldn't be needed, but under the conditions that we live under, we must have them. God never intended a man to have operations and so forth. We'll get into that later. 
But if we have to have them, and we're grateful for the doctor. But do you know what? Of all, we're living in the day when we got the best doctors we ever had. We got the best drugs we ever practiced with. The best hospitals we've ever known to have. And we got more sickness and diseases the world ever known. Because we got more sin and unbelief than the world ever known. That's where your trouble lays, is there. It's predicted that way. Of all the fine medicines, just for this, as we want, all the fine medicines we got in the world, we haven't got one medicine that will cure any disease. Do you know that? We haven't got one medicine that will cure any disease. We haven't got one medicine that will cure a common bad cold. Hundreds die yearly, doctors too, with a bad cold. We haven't got one disease that would heal a knife cut. As common a thing as a knife cut, we haven't got one medicine that will heal it. Why? God said he healed all the sickness. Look here, I want to ask you something. For instance, what tonight, if I got a knife cut in my hand, right here on the platform, there isn't a medicine in the world could heal that cut. Now listen close. Any medicine that would heal a knife cut in my hand would heal a knife cut in my coat. It would heal a knife cut on this desk. Now you say, Brother Branham, you're getting fanatically. Medicine wasn't made to heal your coat. It was made to heal your hand. All right. Let it, me cut my hand, and I'll fall dead. And they come and take me over to the morgue and can inject some kind of a fluid into me. It'll make me look natural for 50 years. Call the best doctors in the world. Let them sew that place up. Give me a shot of penicillin every day. Put sulfur drug in it and everything you wish to. And in 50 years in the day, that cuts just exactly the way it was when it was made. If medicine is made to heal the human body, why don't it heal it then? Is that right? Why? Medicine doesn't build tissue. Medicine only keeps it clean while God builds tissue. Only nature can. What if I was cranking my car and I broke my arm and run into the doctor and say, Hey, healer, heal my arm right quick. I've got to finish cranking my car. You knew I, there's something mentally wrong. You'd say, I can set your arm. That's I study the anatomy. I can set a bone, but there's one healer. That's God. God has to produce the calcium and the, and the stuff that goes into the bone to heal it. God cannot... I mean, man cannot create cells. Well, you say, Brother Bram, the reason that, that that don't heal is because the life has gone out of your body. That's right. Now, if the life's gone out of the body, then why don't the medicine heal? Because medicine's not the healer. Life is the healer. And if you tell me what life is, I'll tell you who God is. That's, he come that you might have life abundantly. Life that does it. If you could only understand that. Here, I say this because my wife is not here. But to think that how God, in His mercy, how that the spoken word created the heavens and earth, the very, very earth that you're setting over tonight is the word of God made manifest. If He didn't word it, He'd get the stuff to make it with. It's the word of God made manifest. I was combing what few hair I have left. My wife said to me recently, she said, Billy, you're getting bald-headed, honey. I said, but I haven't lost a one of them. She said, what? I said, I haven't lost a one of them. She said, tell me where they're at. I said, I'll tell you, answer you if you'll answer me. She said, all right. I said, where was before I got them? <laughs> they was not, then they were, then they are not. Wherever they was before that I got them, they're there waiting for me to come to them. Amen. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. God is not no mysterious. You was. Something had to die for you to live tonight. Did you know that? If you eat beef, the cow died. If you eat pork, the hog died. If you eat cabbage, the cabbage died. If you eat potatoes, potatoes died. It takes death to produce life. Therefore, Christ died that you might live eternally and have eternal life. And no matter how much religion you got, it takes salvation to bring life. 
I'll get plumb off my subject here, go talking on that. We'll get in that tomorrow night and later. Now, but that is right. One fellow said to me not long ago when I was preaching about Abraham when he was sitting in his tent and God appeared to him in two angels. He said, do you mean to tell me, preacher, that was God? I said, that was God. He said, I said, the Bible said so. He said, how was he? I said, yesterday he sat there and drank the milk from a cow and eat the butter and even eat the calf and some cornbread. That's right. God Almighty himself. I said, you limit God to your little thoughts. I said, the very creator of heavens and earth, only thing he did was just step over there and said, Michael, come here. Gabriel, come here. <sighs> Brought up a few what our body's made out of, a few petroleums and cosmic light and hot ash and so forth. Pulled it together and spoke it into existence and put the angels in it and stepped in his cell phone and was hungry. After he blessed Abraham and told him what would happen, stepped right out of it into eternity again. That's our God. So what makes any difference where we're perishing in the graveyard or what makes it? If our soul's anchored in Christ, we got assurance of the resurrection some glorious day. Right? All these little things that's moving on now, these little wheels, mortal wheels that's turning, all come by the program of God. That's right. So he knows how to take care of them if you just let him have them. If you keep them, you'll lose them. If you give them to him, you'll find them. And that's right. But you be sure to give it to him and give all your mind and your thoughts to him tonight now. That he can have the right away in your heart. Dash aside, lay aside every sin that's unbelief. And the weight that's the easy to set you now. That we might run this race with patience that's set before us. Looking to the example. Jesus Christ, God's Son. Now, for our scripture reading. And... I was looking at this clock last night, and it had 2 o'clock, and it still got 2 o'clock. So I better lay my watch out. Now in Psalms 103, we read this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know, on this policy we have... Beneficial. You believe that? Benefits. Nearly all of you have an insurance policy, don't you? Pretty near everybody does today. Some of you insurance poor. I don't have any myself. Here some time ago, an insurance agent come to my house, a friend of mine, said, Billy, I want to sell you an insurance policy. I just got so tired fooling with them. I said, I have one. And my wife turned around as if to think I was lying. She said, Why, Bill? And I said, I have. He said, what kind of insurance do you have? The insurance agent said, so what, so what company is it with? I said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. He said, that's very good, Billy, but that won't put you in a graveyard. I said, but it'll get me out. I'm not worried about getting in. It's getting out. And that's... Nature tells me I'll go there. God told me he'd bring me out. So that's the main thing. I want the assurance of coming out. I want to say, as Paul said, that big dark channel is set before each one of us. Every time our heart beat, we go one step closer to that big dark place called death. But when I come to the end of my journey, my heart stopping to beat, I don't want to be a coward. I want to wrap myself in the robes of his righteousness enter into that knowing this I know him in the power of his resurrection knowing that when he calls from among the dead I'll come out that's the main thing that's the assurance that we're in tonight the blessed assurance the Bible said forget not all the benefits of this policy now while you've got this assurance you've got a benefit too David cried and forget not all his benefits what are they David who forgiveth all of thine iniquity who heals all of thy diseases. What a beautiful reading we have here under consideration. Let's dig into it just for a minute. God, when man was made and put here on earth, we find out that he was made not to sin, he was made a perfect man. Sin's what caused the fall. And now he's in a twofold aspect. 
He is one. He is spirit. Next, he's material. One, he's heavenly, a son of God. The next, he's a creature of destination. And he's got to be gone back to the dust on the count of the fall. And Jesus came to redeem that man. Now I want you to notice Sickness and sin is so closely associated together, it's almost like the soul and body. It's inseparable. Man's got to die, his soul is full of sin, and his body's full of sickness, and death is pronounced on him. He's got to go. His soul is sick, and his body is sick. And Jesus come to redeem both of them. That's right. Not just one. His soul he came to bring complete redemption. And we only have the earnest of our complete salvation now. If there is no divine healing now, there's no resurrection of the body. Correctly. We just have a foretaste of glory divine. What will it be when we see him face to face? What will it be when we... If God Almighty can heal a cancer-ridden person, nothing but a shadow, and raise him up, what will that glorious resurrection be when he comes? Well, God put you here on earth, many of you men and women here tonight, turning gray. A few years ago, you were sweethearts, walked down to the altar and got married. You remember how Mother looked, how pretty? Those beautiful eyes and how Dad's hair was flowing black. It hasn't just a little while. You begin to say, Mother, there's a wrinkle coming under those eyes. Dad, there's some gray coming into that hair. What's the matter? Death set in. It's correct. God raised you up to a certain age. I asked a doctor not long ago in Louisville, Kentucky, when speaking on my trip to Africa. I said, Doctor, I want you to scientifically prove something to me. He said, All right, sir. I said, is it the truth? I want to ask you the question first. Every time I eat, I renew my life. He said, that's correct. Build blood cells. I said, why is it when I was 15, 16 years old, I was eating the same kind of food I'm eating now? Every time I eat, I got bigger and stronger. I'm eating the same food, only more and better, and I'm getting older and weaker all the time. Why is it if I'm pouring water out of one glass into another and it starts filling up, and I pour faster and it starts going down. Scientifically show me why. If I'm eating the same food, putting it into the same body, and I was once growing and becoming strong and great, and then all of a sudden I started and coming back, no matter how much I put in, I'm getting older and older and older all the time. Because God has said. That's it. No way in the world to scientifically prove it. We don't look to science. We look to God. A fellow said not long ago, said, anything that's not scientifically proven isn't real. I said, I'll just vice versa that. Anything that can be scientifically proved isn't real. Well, I said, you must be mentally wrong. I said, well, I want to ask you something. He said, if I can't scientifically prove it, I won't believe it. I said, you believe you've got a mind? I said, scientifically show me what your mind is. You got a wife and children? Show me what love is. Everything that's everlasting, everything that's real is unscientifically proved. The whole armor of God is completely uh, supernatural. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness, patience, faith. Every armor, whole armor of Christianity is supernatural. Now why shouldn't we believe in supernatural things? If the entire armor of the Christian faith is supernatural, we look at the unseen, not what we see. Everything we see is perishable, come from the earth. But we look at things we do not see, and by faith we believe it and accept it. What is diseases? What is this dreadful thing that comes upon people? Let's diagnose it just a moment. Some people have... Well, so much to say that sickness was a blessing. I heard a minister on the radio here not long ago say that God put sickness on people 
to show their humility and to suffer for him and to show patience. If that would be the truth, then Jesus defeated his own cause. That's right. yeah. He defeated his own purpose. Right. Never one place in the Bible is that scriptural, any apostle or any prophet or even Jesus himself ever declared that to be true. That's negative thinking. And you're only trying to excuse your unbelief, preacher, by hiding behind such theory as that. That's not God's word. What we need today is an old-fashioned, God-sent revival back to the Bible and the baptism of the Holy Spirit preached in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to bring people back to a living faith in a resurrected God. Not some dead theology that's been gone years ago and hatched off of different denominations. We need a Bible living faith. Notice, what is diseases? We look upon them and we call them, well, cancer, pneumonia, and diseases like that. That's medical terms. The Bible calls it devils. And if it's devils, it's got to come from the realm of supernatural. Let's take one of the greatest killers we have is cancer. Let's diagnose cancer for a few minutes. What is cancer? The, Greek, the word, medical word comes from that, from crab, many legs. There's several different kinds of cancer. Rose cancer, black cancer, sarcomas cancer. Now let me ask you something. There was a time when you wasn't on this earth. You was nothing. But there never will be a time but what you'll be something or somewhere. So think on this. As long as eternity lasts, you'll be somewhere or something. How did you get here on earth? That's a mixed audience. You listen to a doctor. I'm your brother. Listen. Through holy wedlock, through the germ, the germ of life comes from the male. The female produces the egg. The germ comes out of the blood cell from the male. Anybody ought to know that. You people here from the farms, many of you know it. You take a hen, can lay an egg. But if the male bird hasn't been with her, it'll never hatch. It's not fertile. An old mother bird is springtime, mating time. The old mother bird can get out and make her nest and lay a whole nest full of eggs. And she can sit on that nest, hover those eggs, turn them every few minutes, and sit there until she gets so poor she can't even fly off the nest. And if she hasn't been with the male bird to mate, them eggs will never hatch. They'll rotten right in the nest. It's correct. That reminds me of some of the old coal farm churches we got around Indiana here. Just a nest full of rotten eggs. You can pat them, please them, join them into the church, shake their hands, everything else. But all you got is a nest full of rotten eggs. Right. What we need tonight is men and women with the experience of God has come in contact with the mate of the church, Jesus Christ, and been germatized by the Holy Ghost. It's got faith to believe the word of the living God. How can a man believe God when he's ever come in contact with him? It's only a historical effect. How can a people paint what God used to be? What good does a historical God do to you? What good would it do to take a, a freezing man and show him a nice painted picture of fire? He can't get warmed by a painted picture. Neither can you get salvation by some pictures drawn in some ancient time. The Holy Ghost is right here to give you entire and complete salvation, deliverance from sickness and sin tonight because He's the same tonight as He was in the day of Pentecost. Amen. As I've often said, what's the use of giving your bird good food, vitamins to strengthen his wings to make him fly and keep him in a cage all the time? It's use of trying to send our boys to the seminary and learn all kinds of education, fine words, Greek words, and everything else, and then cage them up and tell them the days of miracles is past. There's something wrong. What we need is to let loose of faith and let God have his way once in a while. And that will produce something. Now, you know where you come from, a little teeny germ. You kept that little germ that crawled, Touch how God determines that. Have you ever seen it work? How that one single germ will take its course and one egg will take its course. God determines that himself. How they come together, develop cells, starting in the spine. 
The first thing you know, it'll bring forth a human being. Everything, a dog will bring dog, bird will bring bird, ever seed after its kind. But now, where did that cancer come from? He wasn't there a few years ago, but here he is. Where did he come from? Where did that cataract come from? Where did that tumor come from? Those other diseases. The doctor says they're germs. Well, they wasn't there. How did they get there? Now, it has to have a beginning. Now we'll speak on cancer. All of the things in natural types of spiritual. Did you know that? All things of natural. Here, here's one for you ministers and Christians. In the natural birth, you mothers, when a baby's born in the natural procedure, what's first? Water. Next, blood. Next, life. Water, blood, and spirit. Any preacher knows that the same three substance makes a new birth. Water, blood, and spirit. That's what come from the body of the Lord Jesus. 1 John 5, 7 said there's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, Son, or Word, and Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There are three that bear record in earth, water, blood, and spirit, and they agree in one. Notice the difference. Are one and agree in one. Water, blood, spirit, all the natural things type the spiritual. Then in the natural things on the earth type the spiritual. A cancer would be a scavenger, like the... The buzzard eats dead things. Cancer usually comes from a bruise. The bruise. First it bruises, and you're full of little cells. And one of those little cells gets smashed, it backslides. Then the first there is a life. Not the life that was there. Another life comes in. Where did he come from? Think of it. It's not complicated. Where did he come from? The devil. And he takes into that. The devil cannot create nothing. The devil only perverts. He can't create, he perverts. And first he has to have a way. Ask the doctor. If your body was perfect and like God made it in the beginning, it would be impossible to get sick. But the devil has to find a weakness. Somewhere to pervert. That's the same thing with your soul. Reason you don't believe in divine healing? The devil found a weak spot in you. And he perverted it. God is the healer. And we're offsprings of God. Sons and daughters of God believing it like our father believes. Notice, this little cell, it was a bruise. And then a life come in that little bruise. The cell backslid. That's a big word for a Baptist to say, isn't it? But you do it anyhow. And it backslid. And the devil put a germ in there called cancer, tumor, whatever it may be. And they begin to develop cells. And he begins to suck on your blood. And that's what he does. He eats you up by pulling your blood. Now, what does the doctor do? The doctor cuts that out. If there's one little speck left, it'll live on. Now, divine healing doesn't deal so much with taking away that growth. Divine healing deals with the devil that's inside of it. The germ, the lie. Now, you know where you come from through holy wedlock by the will of God, which God promised. But the, this germ here that's in you that doesn't belong in you, your germs are life germs. That's a germ of death, which would be contrary to life. So how could it be a blessing? How could God take the devil to be a blessing to you? How could God show his love to you, as people say he does, through striking you down with a disease? Let the devil do it. And we know that sickness is an attribute of sin. Before we had any sickness or any sin, we had no sickness. How can a man preach salvation and not deal? How can you deal with sin in any manner without dealing with sickness? You cannot do it. We always preach on sin and call it sin. 
It's like for a big animal had me with his paw in my side, pulling my ribs out. There's no need of cutting his paw. Just hit him in the head. He kills the whole body. And when Jesus hit sin, he killed every attribute that sin ever produced. So you can't deal with sin without dealing with sickness. Notice. This germ, it starts developing cells. Where did it come from? A life in there developing its cells, coming on, growing, growing, growing. The back of it is a life. That life is not God. There's only two resources life can come from. That's either from God or from the devil. There's only two major spirits, God and the devil. And God gave you life here on earth and the devil comes and takes it away from you. And the cancer is the devil. The life in there is the devil. And what Jesus said, in my name they shall cast out devils. What is that? Take the life out. Now here's where the weakness of of so-called Christianity fails to receive their healing today. They're looking at the lump instead of looking what God said. Could you imagine a farmer planting his corn going out every day and digging it all up, see if it's going to grow or not? He'll never have a crop. He commits it to the earth under this that God promised, and that settles it. That's the way we receive every word of God, because it's a seed, and we receive it in our heart and commit it to God and forget about it. God does the rest of it because He promised He would. God's word. Every word will produce just exactly what it is for the words of seed. Now notice, this cancer, it starts developing cells, growing, it's sly, you hardly know it's there. It keeps moving on, moving on, sucking the blood. Now, what if the doctor can't get it? I've made myself clear that I respect doctors and hospitals and pray constantly for them. What would we do without them? But I'm only trying to tell you what the disease is. God's seen the day coming that people are walking in unbelief like this, and with His love, He let us have doctors and hospitals. Sure He did. That's His love gift to you. But the very first thing you should have is faith in God. And remember, I, if God pronounces you to go, there ain't enough medicine in the world to keep you here. It's all in God. But notice, now this cancer is a-growing. He's a-sucking your blood. And the first thing you know, you start getting weaker. Now, the doctor says, I can do no more about it. You go to God and ask God to heal you. You make Him promises what you'll do. And when, when you do it, you feel in your heart that the prayer of faith shall save the sick, God said. And the prayer of faith is prayed then you feel assured. But now, watch right close now. 90%, yes, 99 out of 100 has hope instead of faith. That's right. The first little symptoms arise, yeah. you'll doubt it. Yeah. And it goes to show it wasn't God-given faith. God-given faith wouldn't take no for an answer no matter what happened. Amen. Now, you can't bluff it. The devil, you can't bluff him. You've got to have the goods to prove it. He recognizes faith. He has to. For it's the only weapon that we have in our hands. And what produces faith is prayer. Prayer of faith shall save the sick. Now notice. Now what happens? Say a person come with a growth. And that growth... It's prayed over, and the assurance comes of the Holy Spirit says, it's finished. The patient goes out. And the first thing you know, I have this all the time. The patient goes out from the place. Oh, they feel better. What happens when anything dies? Anybody knows. Is there anybody in here ever hunted big game? Let's see your hands go up. <laughs> I ain't got many fellow citizens in here ever. All right. A butcher, undertaker, whatever you may be, anything that dies. If you shoot an animal tonight, tell the boys, throw it on the scale, say that deer weighed 500 pounds, even. Be careful. The next morning it's going to be several pounds lighter. It'll start shrinking. Undertaker knows the human body will shrink. 
As soon as life goes out, it starts shrinking. Got false teeth, they'll take them out, artificial eye, until the body is finished shrinking. The cells are drying, and it shrinks. The first day it's shrinking, second day it's shrinking, and the third day it begins to swell because it becomes contaminated or it begins to mortify. That's the reason people are all stunted about Jesus being in the grave three days and nights. It was within three days and nights because David said, I'll not leave his soul in hell, neither will I suffer my holy one to see corruption. Upon that one solemn promise, Jesus said, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Yeah. He knew that not one cell would corrupt. But sometime within that 72 hours, that God would raise him up. For the prophet had said so. Notice, you take a little animal who's run over on the street. Just let him lay there, a little dog or something, for three days and watch what happens. He'll be heavier at the end of three days than he was the day he died. He's swelling. What is it? The cells are breaking. Now, that's what the patient hits. Oh, I've seen them go away with cataracts on their eyes, read the Bible, walk down happy. The next day they say, come back just testifying, glorifying God. Oh, I can see, Brother Branham. And on the, about three days, they're blinder than it was in the first place. The patient begins to get sick with a cancer or tumor. They say, oh, well, praise the Lord, I guess I lost my healing. I'm so sick I can't stand up. Hallelujah, I guess I lost my healing. Oh, if you ain't a poor excuse. Listen, that's the best sign in the world. You've got your healing. Yeah. What is it? That dead growth in you. And it's breaking up and there's, as the heart beats, it pulls the blood and it goes through the heart to purify the body and any infection will cause fever. You know that. And on the third day, you usually have sickness, fever. While that dead growth is laying in you, rotting it away. The life has gone out of it. Now, what did Jesus say about that? When the unclean spirit's gone out of a man, he walks in dry places, and he returns with seven other devils, worse than he was. And by force, if he can, if the good man of the house isn't standing there, your unadulterated faith, knowing that God has promised and has to keep his promise. What did Jesus say again? Go ye and disbelieve no more, or a worse thing than this will come upon you. When God speaks anything, you must fasten your soul onto His Word and hold on to it. No matter what the outside says, your faith looks to the unseen world. Jesus come to destroy the works of the devil. That's why God was made both soul and body. Jesus had both soul and body and yet was God. He came to take on himself the full form of man to redeem the full form of man back to God. That's why he come in flesh and in soul. That's the reason Jesus could say, It's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. And if sickness is a blessing and Jesus come and healed the sick everywhere, then he defeated his purpose in coming. Which would you say would be a blessing? If a loving God, a Father who gave you life and promised you a long life on the earth, if you'd obey him, then he would come and strike you down with the devil and let him lay there and eat you up on the bed with cancer or TB or something, saying, oh God, this is your love to me. Or would you rather say the devil struck me down and a loving God come and heal me and give me life again? Why, a child would know better than to say that God put sickness on people. Don't never pin that on God. Disobedience brings sickness. Jesus never did tell his disciples, never preached it anywhere to ask the disciples to tell people they must stay pinned down with sickness to obey him. He sent them to liberate the sickness and to preach to those in captivity and to those in bondage. He come to bring deliverance. And he can't bring deliverance. He can't do the two things opposite one from the other. He's either got to be the author of life or the author of death. And if you put sickness on to God and say that is God making you sick to die, then you've got to make him an author of death. When death and life cannot associate even together. There never was a 
funeral preached in the presence of Jesus Christ, he broke up every funeral procession he come in contact with. Wow, life and death can't exist together. Amen. Wish I had twice my size. This, I feel so good, maybe I can hold twice as much. When I think of his goodness and his omnipotence and his power. Amen. How the weaselly little so-called spineless Christian of the day is afraid to step out and put God's word first and take him at his word. Notice, Jesus come to destroy the works of the devil. And healing the sick, he proved his messiahship. He proved by seeing visions. The world knew because he didn't take credit to himself. He gave it to the Father. He said, I can do nothing until the Father shows me first what to do. And he healed the sick. And he raised the dead. He cleansed the lepers. And he proved his messiahship. And the church of the living God that will do the same today proves the Messiah is good to his word and living in the church. I think the case of the paralytic proved that Jesus both come to save and to heal. He said to the boy, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Take up your bed and walk. He found out that it was sin. Sins associated with sickness. I don't mean that you've sinned. Your parents before you. God promised he'd visit the three and four generations the sins of the fathers upon the children. But God's the healer. Now notice what's taking place in the life of our Lord Jesus. When he was here on earth, he proved he was the Messiah by the works that he did. He said, if I do not the works of him that sent me, then believe me not. But if I do the works, though you don't believe me, believe the works. I know I'm a little loud. That thing's got an awful voice. But I don't mean to be yelling at you, but I've spoken places before where it wasn't such good acoustics. But now, quickly now, my time's about gone. Notice, the church of the early age, they went for the first three centuries, they preached the gospel and they healed the sick. Then after that, healing and miracles begin to die out. Some people say today, that God promised in his word just to be with the apostles and to heal the sick in the early primitive age of the church. I count that very poor Bible scholarly. There's no such a scripture in the Bible to prove that. God promised in Mark 16, his last commission to the church, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. They'll lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. The first commission he gave to his church was heal the sick. The last commission he gave to the church was heal the sick. Correctly. Then it was to be to all the world. The unbeliever says that was just to convert the heathens. The other side belief says that the reason the church lost her, her place in divine healing, oh, we have a little spirit, but it's very feeble, just enough to move around like somebody about half dead. That's about the way the church of the living God moves today. Just about enough to grunt a little while. Now, I'm not saying that for jokes, but it's the truth. Just enough courage to go down to church and say, well, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Pentecostal, I, just about as much life as they got. It's true. Some rouse it to that. I do the same. I think if the church of the living God stayed in her place and was prayed up and lived in the presence of God right. with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, yeah. that signs and wonders would be flowing from her like a gusher. Amen. Right. I think that's where the trouble is. And you're talking about it was used to convert heathens. That's what God gave it to the church, the primitive church, was to convert the heathens. My dear beloved unbeliever, did you know there's more heathens today in the world ten times as many as there was then? Certainly there is. Two-thirds of the world is unchristianized. And the reason we haven't got no worries is because we've turned all the promise of God into theology, into teaching some kind of doctrines of man and organizations, 
and so forth and failed to produce what Jesus said that the signs would follow the believers. We put more emphasis on organizations and so forth than we have upon the resurrection and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we had more prayer meetings instead of soup suppers and card parties, we'd be a lot better off as Christians. Amen. They've turned the old-fashioned upper room into a supper room. You know that's true. Look what it's done. It's stripped our women. It's demoralized our nation. We're in a crumbling condition. I've always said, don't be scared of Russia coming over and whipping us or any other nation. We're whipping ourselves. It isn't a rob and it pecks on the apple. It hurts it. It's a worm at the core. That's what's the matter here today. It's Hollywood. And you know what's the matter? Hollywood evangelism. Preachers come to the pulpit and got, got the, the real old-fashioned conviction enough to call black, black, and white, white and tell what's the truth. They're afraid of a meal ticket at their church. I want to see a man with a backbone instead of a wishbone. Preach the gospel if I have to lay on my stomach and drink French water and eat soda crackers. I'd rather do it and preach the truth and stand for Jesus Christ than to eat fried chicken three times a day and live in a palace. Amen. That's kind of raw and barefooted, but it'll help you. It's good for your spiritual gastronomics. Help you to swallow the word of the living God. Heathenism. Not long ago in Louisville, Kentucky, I was asked by a group of doctors and ministers to address a little party where there was a club met. And that day the, doc- the doctor that ordained me into the Baptist church was sitting there and told me I had a nightmare. The night when I told him the angel of the Lord appeared to me and said, what to do? He said, Billy, that's the devil. Don't you listen to that. I said, Dr. Davis, he told me that I was to pray for kings and monarchs. He said, with your seventh grade education? I said, I don't know about that, but he said it and I believe it and I'll stay with it. I said, oh, Billy, go over home. You need a rest. I said, I don't need no rest. I'm rested enough. I'm ready to go into the work. That day, standing there before that group of people, they said, we're glad for Brother Bram to give us a, a message today at our meeting. I thought, here's my time, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this. I said, gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here. And you want me to talk about my African campaign. I said, I want to tell you what I found when I went over there. Coming down through the streets of, of Durban with Sidney Smith, the mayor, riding me out where tens of thousands times thousands had gathered for a three or four days meeting. The race tracks was packed over. The biggest crowd that Africa ever had in any kind of a meeting gathered together. What was it? Because I was there? No, sir. Jesus said, if I'll be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. The gospel yet in its simplicity has the greatest drawing crowd card the world has ever known is the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. I noticed natives walking along, colored people as we call them here. They had little tags on them, packing idols in their arms. I said, what's that tag for? So that means they're a Christian. I said, a Christian? And packing an idol? He said, oh yes. Well, I said, I don't get that, Mr. Smith. He said, I can speak Shanghai. Let's ask this one here. I call one over. I just call him anything you want to. I spoke to him. I said, what are you, are you a Christian? Yep, he's Christian. I said, well, uh, why are you packing that idol for? Oh, it's God too. <laughs> well, I said, there's nothing in that idol. He said, well, my father packed it. And said, one day the lion got after him. He set it down, built up a little fire, and said the prayer the witch doctor told him. The lion went away. So if Amalia, uh, the, Amalia means it's an unseen force like the wind. If Amalia, the unseen God, fails, this won't. Now they call that Christianity. It's still a form of heathenism. Right. I said, look, sir, I'm a yacht to myself, or a hunter. I said, listen, the prayer never scared the lion away. The fire scared the lion away. An animal scared a fire. Oh, well, you'd pack it anyhow, sprinkle with blood. When I got up there that day and began to speak to them, and tell them of what Jesus did in the resurrection. What he did when he was here on earth. How he saw visions. How he proved all of it was God. God was in him. Manifesting uh, himself to the world. And reconciling the world back to him. 
I said, if Jesus Christ will come on the scene and will produce the same thing here today before you Mohammeds and the rest of you, will you receive him? Tens of thousands, some of them said, I forget how many thousands, up above a hundred thousand or something, raise their hands, they would. The first person to the platform, no way of holding a prayer line, is that missionaries go get so, so many. The first one was a Mohammed woman. She couldn't speak English. She had a red dot, an Indian dot here in between her eyes. She was a Mohammed. And through the interpreter, 15 different interpreters or more had to interpret to, through Africa, the different tribes. And I said to this woman, I said, why are you a Mohammed coming to me as a Christian? Why don't you go to your priest at the temple? And she said, I believe that you can help me through the interpreter, of course. Well, I said, have you ever read the New Testament? She said, many times. I said, if Jesus Christ is alive today here in Africa and will do the same things here that he did to the woman at the well, will you renounce Mohammed and receive Jesus? She said, I will. And then I prayed. The Holy Spirit come with a vision. It showed the woman and told her that she had a cyst on the womb and she had been to a Mohammed doctor. Her, pa- her husband had taken her, was a sharp man with a black mustache, and he waited out in the hall while she had her examination. And the doctor told her she had to be operated on. She raised her hands and said, That is the truth. And she said, I now accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Hundreds and thousands of Mohammeds begin to scream. What does it take? The commission of the Lord Jesus. Obey his words. Go into all the world and demonstrate the power of the resurrection. Certainly. The next one come was a woman, a white woman. She could speak English. It told her what her trouble was, but told her to prepare for death. She had a little something like a little growth or something, but she's going to die in a few minutes. She walked down and sat down with her husband and began to wonder about that. And dropped dead right there where she was sitting. The next come was a little black boy. He had a, a little sack. They take blood out of a cow's neck and, and put some milk in it and churn it up down with a stick and make a, a lovely lollipop. And they eat the blood and milk. That's their diet. Wearing no clothes hardly, very primitive. A lady gave birth to a baby sitting right down in front of me. Never paid a bit of attention to it. Picked it up and began to nurse it and went on. Then, the next thing happened. This little black boy come, his little eyes were just as crossed they were setting in. I said, now anybody can see that little boy's eyes are, are crossed. If there's anything I could do for the child, I'd be glad to do it. But I can't do it. I'm only a servant of the Lord. It takes him to do it. Perhaps he might tell me the reason why. And I looked back, and there was a vision standing over the little boy. I said, the baby was born cross-eyed. And the mother and father are very strange to be Zula. Because the Zulus are average around 250 to 300. And I said, they're slim people. And I said, the baby was born cross-eyed, way back, 200 yards from me. The father and mother raised up as a witness. I said, it was born in a Christian place because there's a Bible and a picture of Christ hanging on the mud hook. That's right, they were Christians. I said, if I look back at the little boy and his eyes was as straight as mine. I said, anybody sees. Don't have to pray for him. His little faith has made him whole. Pass on through, sonny. And I heard a conglomeration back there of noise, and it was a doctor. And he was saying, trying to get to me. Mr. Bosworth was standing there saying, we can't do that. The anointing's on our brother. You had to call the regular race ride here because they had the tribes separated by fences anyhow. Said he called the race ride. We can't do that. Mr. Baxter went out and said, we we'll have to, can't do that, sir. And he said, I want to speak to him. I turned around. I said, what's the matter, doctor? He said, how did you know I was a doctor? Well, I said, then you don't know that God is here. He said, Reverend Branham, I can understand how that your speech, your psychology, and your mental telepathy can put an influence on the people. I said, mental telepathy, doctor? He said, yes, sir. They said, what did you do to that child? Did you hypnotize it? I said, doctor, did they give you license in England to practice medicine and know more about hypnotism and that? I'm surprised at the Medical Association of England. I said, if hypnotism will straighten a child's eyes, you doctors better practice hypnotism. As scientific results from it. And he said, look, Reverend Branham, I was the one who put the boy in the line. And he was standing there, and his eyes was crossed, and here he is standing here to run cross. 
What happened between there and here? I said, God is standing there. He said, Reverend Branham, great big cow lilies, you listen, ladies ought to see those. Eighteen inches across, wild out in the fields, yellow and white, the prettiest things you've ever seen. Great pictures of them or vases of them sitting on the place. He said, Reverend Branham, I know that God's in that lily. Of course, he couldn't live without God. I believe in a Christian. But he said, is he audible or visible enough or here that could take and pull the strings of that boy's eyes and make him see? Mr. Bosworth got him to the shoulder and said, sir, we'll have to take you away. I said, just a minute. I said, doctor, you witnessed the boy's eyes was crooked there. Yes. They're straight here. Yes. I said, God did it. And they started to pull him away. He said, wait a minute. Walked up to the main mic. Said, then I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I'll never have any more doubt in my mind. That's wrong. And to you Pentecostal people, this might encourage you, you who are Pentecostal. When I was leaving over in Johannesburg about three weeks later, at the airport where thousands had gathered to say goodbye to me, as the plane rolled away, I went to the ramp. This doctor threw his arms around me and kissed me goodbye, speaking in unknown tongues and going into the mission field. That's right. Then he received the Lord Jesus there as his personal Savior at the platform. In the meeting there was a man come who they had to put a chain around his neck and lead him like a dog. He, he had a disease that made him always horrible. You can imagine how he looked. And I said, now if anybody could do something for that poor man who wouldn't do it, it'd be a brute. Now listen closely as we close. This man standing there on his hands and feet, he thought that I wanted him to do a war dance. If there happens to be a missionary here, we know that's what they clown a lot for the tourists and so forth, doing a, their tribe dance. The man wasn't mentally right. And I said, uh, I want to pray with him. And he kept going like that with his hands just down on his all four. Couldn't raise up. And I said, look what a condition that poor human being's in. That man's a soul just like I am. Are anybody else here? I said, if there's any witch doctor that's near, I'll challenge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to come do something for him. That's right. Everybody was quiet. But there'd been a vision over him. I said, the thing he's thinking about, he's thinking about his brother. He was born in a Christian home. When he was yet a baby, he was this way. I said, he's 22 years old now. But I said, in a Christian home, he was born. And his parents raised up to witness the same thing. But I said, he had a brother that was riding either a yellow goat or a dog. And he fell off and he's hurt himself. And he walks on two sticks under his arms like crutches. And I had to look going. I seen a vision of the boy being healed. I said, but thus saith the Lord, the boy's healed. And about a city block or more away from me, I heard a scream. And here come the boy jumping up in the air, holding them crutches over his head, just to scream into the top of his voice. It taken him 20 minutes nearly to get the crowds quiet and the militia and all around. Then in a few moments, I looked again to the man to see what would happen. Above him was a vision like a blue shadow, like looking into a television. There stood the man normally. Oh, my, nobody... Never knows what it is. I've seen the dead raised at the doctor pronounce them dead. I've seen things happen when God has said so like that. All devils out of hell can't stop it. Amen. It's God Almighty. Amen. I've seen him standing there normally. I thought, here's my chance. Here's my chance, Lord. I said, if anybody could help that man, he wouldn't do it. It would be a brute. But I said, I challenge the priest of the Mohammed Temple to come and give him his soundness. I'll challenge the witch doctor or anyone else to come and give him his soundness. None of you can, and neither can I. But the God of heaven has raised up his son, Christ Jesus, and has promised the same thing that he did. We would also, and I've seen a vision on the boy, that he's going to be made well. It's the day of the Lord. If he'll do this, I said, how many will believe on him? And they raised their hands. I walked up to the boy and said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, raise up. He thought I was like this. The interpreter told him again, I pulled a chain. And all of a sudden, he raised to his feet for the first time in his mortal life. The tears run down on his back belly. He began weeping. That crowd went into a panic. And I said, everyone here that now will receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior, stand to your feet. 30,000 raw heathens stood to their feet and accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior at one time. 
foot, ten times bigger than the day of Pentecost, thirty times bigger. Notice what taking place. Mr. Baxter come to me and said, Brother Branham, I believe they meant physical healing. I believe you ought to send it through the interpreters again. I said it again. I said, I do not mean physical healing. I mean that you accept and will renounce all other gods and you will receive Jesus Christ as your Savior if you're sincere. Throw your trinkets on the ground, bust your idols. And it was like a storm of death where the power of God struck the place and 30,000 or more heathens come to the Lord Jesus Christ at one time. Wow! That's what's the matter with the Christian church today. It failed to do what Christ said to do. If I be lifted up, no wonder David could cry, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of our iniquities and healeth all of our diseases. He's still God tonight. I see him perform even greater in India a few months ago to a blind man that we won't have time to say. But what is it, friends? Mr. Bosworth, who's laying out on his dying bed tonight. After they take me from the meeting, Brother Baxter began to weep. I couldn't stand it no more. Such a feeling. It, when I stand there before them ministers and them doctors, I said, Sirs, what you told me was a nightmare. What you told me would cause me to lose my mind. I said, even our lovely Baptist church has been sending thousands of missionaries over there for the past 50 or 100 years. We spent millions of dollars to educate men and send them over there. What do we find them doing? Standing around a little place and pass out a few tracks at an 80 dance. But I said, what you call fanaticism, God took by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and saved more souls at one other call. Now, what I mean today, brother, this old dry church chewing that we've been doing, we need to throw that thing away and accept the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and his power. He's sure tonight to do the same thing tonight that he did on the banks of Galilee. He did in Durban, South Africa, and will do the same thing in Indianapolis, Indiana. Two-thirds of the world heathens. And what one-third, what does the heathen mean, an unbeliever? Two-thirds of the world together make up that group and saying we don't need signs again. And look at the Christian, so-called. Look at the differences with them, unbelief. There's just a small percent of the Christians believe in divine healing. Very few of them believe it. How much more do we need the Lord Jesus in his resurrection tonight? No wonder he said, fear not, little flock, and straight is the gate, and there is the way, and a few there will be that will find life. I declare to you tonight, my dear brother, that the works that Jesus Christ did, he never finished them. He finished his life at the cross that he might pour it back into you, church, and the church would do the same thing he did till he comes again. I find two different types of heathens. One of them is the uneducated, the other is the educated. The hardest people I ever dealt with in my life is in the United States of America. Any other missionary will tell you the same thing. We become so educated. Dr. Jones, I hope there's not no one here with that name. Dr. Jones tells his group, now I don't, there's nothing to that. Days of miracles is past. Dr. John Doe tells, it's spiritualism. There's nothing to it. They said the same thing about Jesus, didn't he? Right. Beelzebub. The other, it's mental telepathy. We're the scientific church. We don't know nothing like that. That's all gone. No one of the poor people's minds are twisted. But Jesus says, give you a sign. These signs shall follow them that believe. I can't save you. I can only obey what he says do. It's up to you for your salvation. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, as we stand here tonight over this sacred desk, preaching the gospel, the unadulterated word of God, I pray that you'll bless this people. Oh God, once more, once more, dear God, as I've told them of Africa and in many different places around the world, how that you've scooped in the millions already into the kingdom of God by obeying what you said do. You said in the last days you'd pour out a double potion. It would come to pass in the last days that these things would come to pass. You promised it. We're so happy tonight, Lord, to have this blessed assurance to know that our hearts are in trim with you and the things that you do, our spirit bears record with it, that it comes from your word and its truth. Your word cannot be denied, and you can't deny your word. 
I pray, Father, tonight that you'll let the angel of God who spoke to me in the way, that he'll come again tonight for one more witness this side of eternity before Jesus comes and will manifest the resurrected Lord Jesus before this audience. And may each one as they sit trembling in their seats look and live. Granted, Father, for we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus for his glory. Grant that it'll be so for God's glory. Amen. Now, my dear heavenly friends or heavenly host here that we're gathered together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, I challenge your faith tonight to believe what you've heard to be the truth. I cannot heal people. There's no other man on this earth can heal people. God has already did it in Calvary under us. I know it's hard for you to believe it. It's been, you've been preached against it. But listen, Jesus Christ, the Bible, you can't say that's not inspired. It's an inspired word of God. Christ is the same yesterday day, and forever. And Christ said the things that he did would his church do also. He'd be with them to the end of the world. And I want to ask you something. If by his grace he will come tonight and do the same thing that he did in the Bible times when he was here on earth, will you cast all doubts away and know it's the devil trying to get you to doubt and will receive him? Will you do it? Raise your hands to him if you will do it. Thank you. May the Lord bless you. Now the boys will come and give the cards or whoever. I'm, what? C's one to a hundred. All right, let's see. Where did we start at last night? Number one. We started one last night. Well, let's start at the last of them tonight. How I many we had about 15 up here last night, didn't we? Let's try 15, the last 15. That'd be 85, 99, 5, 85. Who has prayer cards? C85. Raise up your hand, will you? 85. Look at your little ticket. It's a little thing you've got a C and a number on the back of it. C85. Can you raise your hand? 85, all right. 86, come on over here, brother, sister, whoever it is, and stand on this side over here. 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90. You come first. That'll be the first five. Will you raise your hand so I can see you? I believe or stand up that I might know who you are as I call your numbers. 85, is it? 86, all right. 85 next. 86, 87, 88, 89, 90. 91, who has 91? Raise up your 91, all right, sir. 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, and 100. Look around. If somebody's got to see how many we can get of this, we can't get them all, we'll call somewhere else. All right. Now, while they're coming, let me ask you something. While, if Brother Jose, some of you get down there and help the boys, if you will, and see if they're all get lined up. If somebody's sharing, look around your neighbor. Maybe he can't hear. If he can't, he'll miss his place in the prayer line. If he can't hear, if his number's been called, raise up your hand for him. And if you're somebody can't get up, raise up your hand. We'll have the ushers to bring you. We got men here to do such as your numbers are called. Now, we'll get through this. If the Lord willing, we'll start another group just in a few minutes. All right. Now, how many believe this story? That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is a living tonight and not dead. Let's see your hand. Now, how do you know only by faith, but if he promised that he would show himself to the believers to the end of the world, would show himself to the believers to the end of the world. How many believe the Bible teaches that? Yet a little while and the world, unbelievers, will see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you how long? To the end of the world. Is that Cato Tabernacle in this night? The end of the age. Christ will be the same. Well, if he is the same, I want to know how many, some Jews came on time. No, I beg your pardon, it was Greeks. And they said to Philip, which was a Bethesda, Sirs, listen close, Sirs, we would see Jesus. How many ever heard that scripture? I want to ask, would you like to see him? Do you believe you can see him? Certainly. A little boy down our way, I live on the Ohio River. He asked his teacher one day, he said, first he said, Mother, God is so great, can anybody see him? She said, ask your Sunday school teacher. She is a little painted up Jezebel, so she said, chewing her chewing gum, she said, I don't know, you have to ask the pastor. The pastor said, no, son, no man can see God and live. He was discouraged. He went up with an old fisherman up around the Six Mile Island. And on his road back down one evening after a storm, a rainbow come out. The old man was paddling the boat. He started weeping. His white beard frosted for eternity. The tears rolling down. 
the little boy sitting in the stern of the boat raised up and went up towards the bow and said, Sir, I'm going to ask you a question. My Sunday school teacher, mother, or pastor couldn't answer him. Say, can any man see God and live? The old man laid down his oars and picked the little boy in his arms. He said, bless your heart, honey. All I've seen for the past 35 years has been God. When you get him inside, you can see him out there. That's the reason he said a little while and the world won't see me no more. But you'll see me. And the things that I do shall you do also. More than this shall you do. I know you say the King James says greater, but the right translation is more. You couldn't do greater. He stopped nature, raised the dead, and everything else. But not in quality, but in quantity, because he'd be in the church universal. More than this shall you do. The very same thing. These things that I do shall you also. And more than this, for I go unto my Father. Now, may the good Lord bless you as we're trying now. And if we went down here tonight to find Jesus, would he be dressed any different from other men? Walked right around man, and man didn't even know who he was. Right. Did he have such a great accent and such a melodious voice that people would just flock to hear his melodious voice? The Bible said that the common people heard him gladly. Then you wouldn't find him in great, big, swell, swanky churches. He wouldn't be there. If he's the same yesterday and forever, he'd be with the poor people. Those who received him. The big, swanky people said, Oh, it's middle telepathy. He's the chief of the devils. Why, he's reading those people's minds. Jesus said, you say that about me, I'll forgive you. But when the Holy Ghost comes and does the same thing in so many words, it'll never be forgiven you. In this world or the world to come. And he promised that these same manifestations of signs and wonders would be done until he returned to the earth. And I believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, here's where I believe the Bible. It's either the truth or it's not the truth. There's many promises in there that I haven't got faith enough to make manifested. But I'll never stand in somebody's way who does have the faith to do it. See? I believe it. Whether my faith can produce it or not. My faith is in my gift that God has given me. What I see, that's what I speak. What he tells me, that's what I say. I know nothing else but what he tells me. And I am... 47 years old, I've seen my first vision when I was 18 months old, and he has never at one time, and I challenge any person of the tens of thousands of things that he has said, if he ever told one thing but what come to pass just exactly the way it said it would. And it never will fail. It can't. It's God. Uh, Brother Woods, how, is everything all right? Got all the people down there? All right. Bring your first person up then. Oh, I'm sorry, lady. I didn't. It's kind of hard to be preaching. I don't know. You're such a lovely audience and so much spirit of the Lord here. It's just hard to keep away from it. Usually in our campaigns, the manager does the speaking. I come right straight from my room where nobody speaks to me even through the day. Right straight to the pulpit. Under the anointing, call the prayer line and start the meeting. How many ever see me do that? Let's see your hands. How many of you? What a different meeting. But you see here, it's a convention. It's got to be the words got to be plain. If we had just about three or four weeks to stay, then it would be different. But just a few seeds may be sown. Just forget all, just take all the superstitions away from me tonight. Last night I could feel it, friends. You want to believe, but yet there's something behind you moving. See? Now look, let everybody know this as surely, that no man on earth can heal you. Divine healing. There is no other healing in the world except divine healing. Medicine doesn't heal. Hospitals doesn't heal. Surgeons doesn't heal. They just clean the place where divine healing takes place. You lose your organ by surgery, but God does the healing. If your faith isn't enough to purge that and make it well, God has a surgeon to cut it away. Now, remember that's truth. Now, surely God wouldn't let an era blast forth a revival that's covered the earth and sent millions of people to the kingdom of God and be an era. And it's been tried through every fiery furnace I know of in every nation. That's Pastor Bose here, my associate. In many places in the world. 
me be. There's a devil standing there. I've never seen the time but what God always slayed that thing and come out victorious. I've seen people paralyzed from the insulting it and laying paralyzed yet today. I've seen people drop dead and not live two minutes after they said it. I've seen epileptic striker crowding as many as 28 at a time receive epilepsy. See? That's right. Diseases go from one to another. You know that. Remember those vagabonds who thought they could cast out devils like Paul did? Not playing church. We're living in church. This is the last days. And these signs are accompanying a, just before a great destruction is going to strike this country. You better get in Christ right away. If Christ comes tonight, I don't say he will. If he does, he'll do the same thing that he did when he was here on earth. Here's a woman standing here. I don't know the lady. I don't guess we've ever met, have we, lady? We're totally strangers. Here's just a woman standing here. Never seen her in my life. Know nothing about her. She knows that's truth. Isn't that right, lady? Now, I don't know her. Never seen her. Know nothing about her. She's just a woman. I'm a man. She can verify the same thing. You may know her. Maybe your sister right here at Cato Tabernacle, for all I know. I couldn't tell you. God knows I don't. Now, what if Jesus is standing here with this suit on that he gave me? And what if she's sick? Maybe she is. I don't know. What would he do if she wanted healing? He would quickly, the only thing he could do was say he had already done it. Is that right? How many Bible readers knows that's the truth? It's already purchased. Now, if she kind of doubted it being him, he might give her some sort of a sign. Now, he might be a man with nail scars painted in his hand, or he might have nail scars, but that, that wouldn't make him Jesus. Just like a badge won't mean an officer, he's got to have a paper or credential to prove it. Any cheap spy can have a badge. I mean, that doesn't mean anything but credentials to prove it. Now, the credentials of Jesus Christ is his life made manifest. Is that right? Then he'd do the same things that he did when he was here on earth. Now, let's take a woman's picture where Jesus met a woman at the well of Samaria. How many knows the story? St. John, the fourth chapter. What did Jesus do to that woman? The first thing he went to talking to her. Is that right? Said, bring me a drink and got the conversation. Just went on and on. What was he doing? Now, you have to take my word for this. He was contacting her spirit. What is it? Her life. And when God the Father, which he said that he couldn't do nothing until the Father showed him, and God the Father had showed him what was wrong with the woman, and he told her. Said, you got, go get your husband. She said, I don't have any. Said, that's right, you got five. That was her trouble. Is that right? Why, she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. She said, now we know, we Samaritans, we know that when Messiah cometh, do you believe Jesus was the Messiah? Said, when Messiah cometh, we know that when he comes, he'll tell us these things, but who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. If that was the Messiah sign then, it would be the Messiah sign tonight of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is that right? The things that I do shall you also. Would you believe that, lady? Would the audience believe that? Now it's up to you, Father, to do the rest. Amen. I shall talk to the woman. I'm going to ask you from this on, if there's an unbeliever here, I'm not responsible for what happens. Remember, diseases goes from one to another. I'm going to ask the people, being that I know an epileptic is present, is charging against me as soon as the angel of the Lord comes. Have you seen the picture of it yet? Did they show it here tonight? They got a bunch of them here. You'll be seeing it tomorrow. It's back here now. And it, they'll tell you the story of it first. The angel of the Lord, whose picture you'll see tomorrow, who hangs in Washington, D.C. tonight. It's truth, the same pillar of fire that led the children of Israel, the same Jesus that met Saul on the road down this year. I know that, and at the day of judgment, my words will be weighed out to me. You see, what good would it do me to stand here and say something that was wrong? See, it wouldn't work. God knows that. But now, if the angel of the Lord is here and do the same thing, do you believe that if he'll produce the same thing, will you believe with all your heart then, lady? With all your heart. Now, everybody be real reverent. Keep quiet. Keep in prayer. I just want to talk to you. And you know now that the Lord Jesus is there. And knowing that I have no way at all of knowing you, we've never met each other before in life. That is true. 
But if Jesus has raised from the dead, as I claim that he has, and this is a divine gift that has been given in order that the last days that people would have no excuse but what would know that Jesus Christ has raised from the dead. All other religions is false. Christianity is right. And it's the only religion that can prove that its founder is alive. Other religions, Buddha, Mohammed, Confucius, all those are dead and gone. The grave swallowed them up in that instant. But Jesus raised from the dead. And he promised, the things that I do shall you also. And then if he'll produce the same thing here between you and I tonight that he did the woman at the well, we should believe him. I'm only contacting your spirit, sister, as a speak. You're aware that something's going on. You know, I want you to raise your hand to the audience if that's right. If you feel kind of a real lovely, sweet feeling, right, you know it. That's the angel of the law. If some of the ushers will slip around to the back and give Matt and Bose one of those pictures, I'd like them to bring it to the platform. And that's what's between you and I now. Now, if God will tell me your trouble, and if he knows what has been in your life, now if I'd stand here and say, well, sister, you're wanting to get a thousand dollars to pay off a mortgage, you're going to get it. Well, uh, if I'd say to you, you're sick, you're going to be healed. If you're sick, you'd come say, Reverend Branham, I'm sick, I need so-and-so. Well, you're going to get well. Well, you'd have to take my word for that. But if Christ is here and can tell you what has been in your life, you know whether that's right or not. See? Then you can have faith to know that it's Him. Because you know that part of your life. Is that right, audience? That would give you faith to know. But you know what? I don't know. But as if the audience can still hear my voice, which I, I hope they can, as the woman now realizing that between she and I comes the angel of the Lord. The woman is fading away, and I see her going under a surgery or something. Yes, I see her come out and go again. She's had two major operations. That is right. That's thus saith the Lord. That's true, isn't it? Now, do you believe? Now, if you talk to the woman more, now, if you only knew what that does to you, what is it? It's in another world. Strength is now beginning to fade. See? Now, just to speak to the lady, this one person ought to settle it forever for the whole group of you. Moses and Aaron didn't do their sign every time they met. Uh, Israelites said, here, look here, I can heal my hands of leprosy and I can perform a miracle with a stick. They did it once and everybody believed them. This should settle it. That was truth, wasn't it, lady? Whatever it was told you. See, I, it, now, on the tapes, they can tell me tomorrow, I think I dreamed it. See, it's like a dream. Now, but now, if you look and li- believe, now, whatever was wrong, now just uh, catch your spirit again. Yes, sir? I see it coming back. You have a shadow dark shadow that's following you, which means that you got a cancer. That's right. And the cancer is on the leg. That's the left leg. That's right, isn't it? That's true. I want to ask you something. You have had a, something to you in your lifetime, even since a young lady that you have a desire and a feeling that God had something for you to do in His vineyard. Now, as the people out there, a thought meets me now from Satan outside of the realm that tells me any woman would have that desire, I'll go and show Satan that he's a liar. By this, and you know I'm telling you the truth, and you know whether this is God or not, you've never been spiritual enough in your life to accept what God has promised you to do. That is right, isn't it? You're needing the Holy Ghost. No, that's exactly right. You're seeking for it now, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's exactly right. That's thus saith the Lord. 
And besides that, if I tell you something, you were very happy today. You had to make a big decision. You were supposed to fly away from this city. You're not from this city. You're supposed to fly away from here to a funeral service. And you put it off in order to get in the meeting tonight because something told you that you was going to receive a prayer card. When you received the prayer card not being number one, you were surprised. But when the angel of the Lord so ordained it that I called you first, you were happy. That's right. Is that true? Now you're healed in the name of the Lord. God has ordained it to be so. Go and may God be with you, my dear sister. down. Have faith. Now be seated. Don't stir around. Remember, those things are at large. They'll come right to you. The angel said, if you get the people to believe you, if you don't obey, then you don't believe. Just a few minutes, they'll take me. I'm obligated to this woman. Lady, I don't know you, but you couldn't hide your life if you had to. You're in the presence of not your brother. You're in the presence of Jesus Christ. Him raised from the dead. I'm only yielding. It's His Spirit doing the speaking. Do you believe that? Then God can help you. Surely. You know I don't know you. No way at all for me to know anything about you. But God does. But I see you at your home. Praying. You've been much in prayer, and especially since you know to this meeting. Just praying by bedside. That is right before coming. Not reading your mind. That's truth. That God will let you get in this line to be prayed for. Because you're real nervous. And I see you to for a doctor or something. Yes, it's cancer. And the doctor gave you up to die. There's nothing can be done for you. And you've lived over the point of time. I see the shadow end and start again. God spared you, lady. That's right. He told me I should live three months. tell me that you believe it's a resurrected Jesus? Man, he said this. If there's a spirit anointing me, that depends on your faith now. If there's a spirit here on me that knows you, knows all about you, if you believe it's the Son of God, then the Son of God said, if they lay their hands on the sick, them kind of believers, these signs shall follow them, they shall recover. You believe it? Then come near. Oh God, I come to challenge this devil. You've hid from the doctor, but you can't hide from God. Come out of her, Satan. In the name of Jesus Christ, God has so ordained this to be, and you leave her, for we cast thee away in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. Go happy, sister. Watch for about three days now. All right. Have faith in God. Believe. You believe? All things are possible. You believe, lady? You believe me to be his servant? The reason I ask you that, when he met me in the room, the books will be here tomorrow. You can read it. He said, if you get the people to believe you, I said, I'm uneducated, sir. They wouldn't believe me. said, as the prophet Moses has given two signs to prove to Israel to vindicate his ministry, and he was sent down to tell the people the truth. said, you're given two signs. And by this they will believe you. Now, and I questioned him, and he referred it back to the Scriptures. So it has to be every time the Scripture, or I wouldn't believe it. No matter what angel or what. If it doesn't testify according to the scriptures, it's not true. I'm a stranger to you. I don't know you. God knows you. 
Friends, I wish you would be real quiet. People are being healed. Please sit still just a moment. Brother Wood, stand by near. Getting weaker and weaker, but if you'll just really be reverent just a minute or two longer. For the sake of these people that's been called in the line, they'll take me, but don't. See, your spirit, every spirit in here is under my control. That's right. And when you move, that interferes. You move. The Holy Spirit be moving somewhere, and you're coming to me, and then somebody moves that upsets me. Be reverent. The Bible said, be still and know that I'm God. Be reverent. Be praying. You say, well, I'm not sick. Well, pray for somebody that is sick. Get to praying and asking God. I challenge your faith, any of you, in Jesus' name, to believe what I'm telling you to be the truth, that Jesus Christ died and rose again, and this is Him, not me. Trying to get to your blind eyes to open them, to let you know that He lives and here tonight. Ask Him. Say, Lord, if it's so, let Him speak to me. And watch what happens. You, without prayer cards or any way of getting up here, believe it. You're not standing here for yourself. You're standing here for a woman, another person. That's very sick. And that woman has a cancer, and it's in the bladder. That's right. You got that handkerchief for her there. Your friend doesn't live here either. She's from another country. That's a hilly country, mountain country. A lot of, I see mines, coal mines, I believe it is. Mountain. It's Pennsylvania. That's right. You got the handkerchief, haven't you? And it's here. Dear Heavenly Father, across the nation, thou knowest, Lord, no man won't believe you. Yet, Lord, make your works manifest. Regard the faith of this woman as I send this handkerchief in Jesus Christ's name. May the Spirit of God that's here now who knows the person, may it heal her. And this act of faith, for we ask it for God's glory. Amen. God bless you, sister, in your gallantry of doing this. May you find it even so as you have asked. God be with you. You believe, lady. I don't know you, never seen you. But you're extremely nervous. And you got a growth on you, under your left arm. That's right. Tumors. Come here. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I now lay hands upon this demon, the body that's swelling out here to this woman, and I charge thee, Satan, as I come, you're not afraid of me, but you're afraid of who I represent. The Lord Jesus Christ and his vicarious suffering, his triumph over you at Calvary. And I charge you to his blood and the commission that's given by the Holy Ghost and the angel of God who's declared this gift. Come out of the woman in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, it's gone. You're well. Go home rejoicing. It's all gone. Let's say praise the Lord. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Believe with all your heart. We're strangers, lady. I don't know you. Never seen you. We're born probably miles apart and years apart. But God knows both of us. Sister, you're trying hard. You got epilepsy. Sitting there on the end of the seat, that black demon shadow around you. He's a devil. But you're praying that God will remove it, aren't you? He's praying to God that let God let him turn and call to me. Is that right? Believe him. And may it leave you and never come back. In the name of Jesus Christ. Satan, you're an offense. Leave in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, he's scared of God. You have faith in the Lord Jesus. He's here. And all of his powers of his resurrection. The only thing you have to do is to have faith to believe. (laughs) 
Look, lady, to me just a minute. See that little lady sitting there with her handkerchief up to her mouth? Right there? She's praying. There stands up right, standing over. She's praying because she's a seer at her home. She's suffering with a nervous condition. That's right, isn't it, lady? A mental distress. Satan trying to tell you that you're just about finished. Isn't that right? This lady had the same thing. But he's a liar. He's defeated. See how Satan tries to get by with his meanness? Oh, God. God's more than a match for him on any ground. You're suffering beyond that. You're suffering with a heart trouble. A killer. That's right. Not only that, but you, you've got dropsy. Your body's all full of fluid. Doctors can't seem to do nothing about it. That's right. And you're not from this country. You're from another country. And that's a country with great, tall pines. And you have to come through an immigration coming here. You're from Canada. That's right. From O.T. to Ottawa, Canada. Return home. In the name of Jesus Christ, may you go and be well. To the glory of God. I'm not beside myself. I know where I am. But oh, if you could only know the glory of Him. That's, he's Alpha, Omega. The beginning and the end. The rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the morning star. The root and offspring of David, he that was, which is and shall come. The omnipotent, the true and living God, the resurrected Christ, the judge of all eternity, the king of the church, the power of him that was dead and is alive again forevermore. Glory to his holy name. You are strange to me, lady. I don't know you. But he who is omnipotent, non-mission, he's known you and fed you all your life. He knows every move you've made. Now that the Holy Ghost is here, that's Christ in his resurrection, the comforter that was to come, who he had stand in his name. And when he comes, he'll tell you all things and will show you things to come. Leave us now this. I see you've been under surgery. Right? That was for a female trouble. It's a tumor in a female gland to cut it away, but it's coming back. That's right. You're weird about it. That's right. You're a married woman. You got a husband. You believe me to be God's prophet? He wants to be prayed for too, doesn't he? He's got a hernia, hasn't he? That's right. Raise your hand. You believe the Lord Jesus and His power of His resurrection? Then receive, lady, according as you have believed, may it be unto you, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Had a strange feeling when he got up down there a while ago, didn't you? When he got up and started up here in the line when I called your number, it left you then. Go on. Heart trouble won't bother you, and God will make you well. God bless you. Have faith in God. Neither cancer, nor rheumatism, nor arthritis can ever phase God. You believe he can take it away from you? Then in the name of Jesus Christ, I lay my hands on you and ask for it to go in Jesus' name. Amen. Come and believe. Have faith in God. Heart trouble is a killer. But Jesus is not. Will you exchange tonight and go to Calvary for healing from Christ? Do you believe he'll give it to you? Then I rebuke this demon that's bothering you in Jesus Christ's name and ask him to go. Amen. Go believing now. Have faith. Lady, there's an operation waiting for you for a tumor. That's right. But God can go in like he did to Adam's side. Take that tumor without an operation. Do you believe it? Will you receive it? Then may you receive it. In the name of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Amen. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. 
Got a lady's trouble. Nervous. Got a heart trouble. Now, heart trouble is really not a heart trouble. It's a nervous heart. Usually after eating and laying down, then you have trouble with it. Flutters and carries on. That's the truth. That's right. It's a nervous heart instead of heart trouble. You're nervous. You've been that way since you went through the time of life of menopause. Been nervous for a long time. You're a deep thinker. You're always crossing bridges before you get to and planning something that never happens. That's exactly the truth. Taking other people's burdens to yourself and never comes out right. Throw the thing away and accept Jesus. Will you do it now? Then the flutter will stop and you'll be well. Do you believe me as God's servant? Lord God, bless this woman who I bless in the name of the Lord Jesus for this glory. Do you believe? Have faith in God. All things are possible to them that believe. Bow your heads just a moment. I want you to pray with me. The boys are touching my side. I don't know what it means. They know I've got enough. Visions are still breaking over the audience. There sits a woman sitting on her with your head bowed praying. you got a sore in your mouth, haven't you, sister? You believe God will heal you? And you can have it. God bless you. Lay your hand on the lady sitting next to you with arthritis there. God bless you, lady. You believe God heals you too? Raise up your hand. There you are. Now you can be healed also. God be merciful to you. Lady sitting right back here nervous. You believe that God will make you well? If you do, raise up your hands. Receive it. God bless you. You're going to have what you ask for. Amen. You got heart trouble and arthritis. It's H.M. Yost sitting there. You believe that God will make you well, lady? All right. God bless you. How do I don't know what your name was? God tells me. Have faith in God. All that believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead and is here now, I want you to raise your hand. If I've ever told you the truth, I've told you the truth, and God has confirmed that I've told you the truth. Now I'm telling you in the name of Jesus Christ, your healing was purchased at Calvary. What more can God do? He sent His Word. He sent His Son. He sent His signs. He sent His prophets. He sent everything to prove to you. I want you to do something for me. Lay your hands over on one another. No matter how sick you are or who you are. Lady, lay your hand on that waterhead baby. I want you to put a string around its head tonight. I want you to measure its head. Tomorrow, I want you to cut off how much it shrunk and lay it on this platform tomorrow night. For thus saith the Spirit, you'll see additions in that baby's head. The audience will know that Jesus lives. As you lay your hands on each other, let us pray. God will hear my prayer from here for every one of you, like you would out there. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Almighty God, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift, send thy blessings upon this people who waits now. You see them with their hands on each other. Satan, you are exposed. You are rebuked by the scriptures and by the Holy Ghost and by the resurrected Lord Jesus. You can't hold them any longer.